review will probably be an hour, hour and a half. Maybe two. But assuming that y'all have already gone through day one and day two of this, uh, this information should still be pretty fresh on your mind. Ain't that right, Graham? Correct. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Anyways, whenever it comes to IP networking, a lot of our radios and whatnot, and actually just a lot of equipment in general, is typically moving over to IP networks, which is why it's essential for all RF troops to know how IP networks operate, whether it be the devices or the protocols that they use in order to communicate with other networks. And that what we're going to be learning about in Block 6. For Objective 1 Alpha, we're kind of going going to go over the broad overview of IP networking basics. So the objective for 1 Alpha is going to be identifying basic facts about internet protocol networking. This is a knowledge-based objective measured by a 30-question test. You have to get at least 21 correct in order to pass or in order to receive a 70%. However, I fully expect everyone in here to get at least a 90. I'm pretty sure it can happen. I'm Not fairly... Posting, my block 2 had 8 hundreds because we did this. Dang. Well, look at that. So, Martin, will you get on 100 on this? That's my aim every test. That's your aim every test. You know what? That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. All right, so we're going to be covering Internet Working Basics Fundamentals. We'll talk about the OSI reference model, the TCP IP model, the network media, and IPv4 and IPv6 addressing fundamentals. Like I said, it's going to be a fairly quick review just because a lot of y'all have already gone through the material over the past two days. Now, the smallest form of a network is typically known as a local area network. This typically covers a small area or a single building or a small group of buildings. For example, uh, Jones Hall or Bryan Hall. The networks or all the devices that are within those buildings are all connected to each other forming a local area network. However, a wide area network is sim simply a collection of those local area networks all connected together. And like it says on the screen, it covers a large area or a substantial number of computers. And like I just stated, it's multiple LANs connected together. Also, I just now noticed, which is something I probably should have noticed earlier, uh, Sara McCusker. Um, if everyone double clicks my name, yes, there is supposed to be video. Double click my name on the live, and yeah. you should be like able to see yeah. the stream. Because right now I see that there's only five viewers. That was my bad. I thought everyone. I thought because... everyone was already in here. So we have seven people in here right now. Yeah. Eight people now. Let's okay. Try to get everyone else. That was my bad. I should have. I should have noticed that. Myself. So we should have ten people in here right now. So only one person's not. I believe it's um, Uke Buandu. Yes, sir. Um, are you are you seeing? Oh, wait. No, are you seeing the uh, video right now? No. If you uh, click on, you're on your phone, aren't you? No, I'm on the laptop. 
Ah, uh, okay. So if you double click my name, uh, you should be able to watch the uh, stream. Or if you just click my name, it should give you the option to watch the uh, stream. There it is. I believe that's totally everyone. Totally just tried right? to click your minimize button on the stream to try and help that person. Yeah. Because I got it on full screen. That was that was the thing that just happened. All right, cool. Well, now that everyone yeah. has the video to it, now we can actually continue on. So like I said, wide area networks made up of local area networks that are connected together. Now, several specific networks that we're going to discuss are going to be the internet, the intranet, and extranet. So internet, as we all know, is a large public network because everyone has access to it. That's right, Prawl, uh, Graham has access to it. Uh, I, I'm, man, I'm, I feel like I'm going to butcher some people's names just for like the first day or two. But I'm sure we'll all be okay with that. But everyone has access to it. It's used to share information with everyone on it. Now an intranet is simply a private network. Can anyone give me an example of a private network or an example of an intranet? It's okay if you're wrong. I... We're, we'll get past it, but anyone? Uh, the CTS wireless? CTS? Yeah, it's CTS. The only people that have direct connection to CTS or have direct access to CTS are those that are directly connected to it. And the only people that have direct connection to it is pretty much anyone that's in Jones Hall or currently in the dorms right now, as long as they have the required information to join that network. So an intranet is simply just a private network. Only people within the network have access to it. An extranet is a private network that's accessible to select outside users. Meaning that people that aren't directly connected to this private network can still form a secure connection to this network. Does anyone know with what a user has to have in order to connect to the extranet? An opcrit badge so they no. can get into the base. Sorry, <laughs> it's not that. Close, I mean, not, not really, but you know what, you tried Credentials? I'm sorry? Some sort of login credentials? Yeah, we could say that. That's kind of headed towards the right path. Anyone? This process or this uh, technology uses tunneling in order to get or perform a secure connection? Yeah, a CAC card and a VPN, not necessarily a you don't need a, a CAC in order to uh, access it, but more or less just the VPN or the virtual private network. Now, if you're wanting to access the AFNET from off base, for example, like if I have my government computer right now at home, and I try to get access to the Air Force network, I would have to log in with my CAC card. And then I would have to use the VPN that's installed on my laptop in order to connect with the network on an Air Force base, even though I'm connected to my Wi-Fi at home. So intranet is just a private network. Extranet, private network accessible to select outside users. All right, now there are three different categories of wide area networks. We have MANs, CANs, and GANs. Now, what do those three stand for, class? The area network. I'm sorry, say that again? Metropolitan area network. Metropolitan area network. Okay, that's one. Campus, Campus area, area network. Campus area network and? 
global. Is it global? Yeah, it's global. That's right. Connection points around the globe. Now, the those terms are kind of subjective just because you can use those terms depending on the amount of area it covers. So, for example, a campus area network covers a campus area. I know. A little hard to understand that. It's right in the name, though, so don't get confused on that. Pretty much campus area, school campus, university. And then a metropolitan area network covers a few blocks of a city. And then lastly, a global area network, or again, has connection points around the globe. Make sense? Yep. I would say it makes sense. Any questions so far? Nothing? Tracking. Nothing? Tracking. Uh, we don't say that in here. We say Raj. 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 All right. Now, networks typically fall under two different types of network classifications, and those classifications are determined by the roles that the computers or the devices play on that network. Now, the two roles that can be performed by the devices are known as a client or a server. Servers share resources or serve and manage network resources like email servers, file servers, and printer servers. Clients request the access to those shared resources, access network resources like host computers, they could be the printers, and they could be things like cameras that are connected to the network. And now we can move into the two different types of network classifications. Like I just said, it's determined by the roles that are played by computers on the network. In a client-server network classification, most devices act as clients, while maybe one or two computers are acting as servers. Can anyone give me an example of a client-server network? The Wi-Fi that we're currently using? Uh, yeah, we could say that. We could say that. What's, one, what's another one? Where are y'all pulling yeah. all your school documents from? From CTS? Yeah, from CTS. CTS would be considered a client-server network because all of your computers right now are acting as what? Clients. Yeah, they're all acting as clients. You're all requesting information from the server. Meanwhile, the server is providing you with those resources that you're requesting. The other network classification is peer-to-peer, -peer, where all computers on the network act as both clients and server. That's a good question. Sorry, McCusker. Does anyone know the answer to that? I believe he's asking if AFNET is a client-server network classification. Would that happen to be true, Clint? Y'all may or may not know just because y'all don't y'all have never really interfaced with AFNET, but does anyone happen to know? Anyone want to take a guess at what network classification it is? Client server. Yeah, it's definitely a client server. My our, all of our computers so still smart. act as clients. Meanwhile, whenever we're trying to access documents online, all of our documents are located on the server. Anytime, Sarah McCusker, that's what I'm here for. All right, now enable, or I'm sorry, in order to actually access a network, you're going to have to to have some type of network component that allows you to interface with that network. Now, every single one of your devices 
contains this piece of equipment known as a network interface card or a NIC, which is a circuit card inside of a network device, which enables it to access a network. Uh, all laptops have this. All, in fact, all devices usually have this. Um, if you look at the bottom left, you can see that that is a NIC that you can install into a PCIe slot of a motherboard. Um, and then also, most motherboards already have the NIC soldered into it, which is what you typically plug your uh, twisted pair cable into whenever you're trying to connect it directly to a router. Uploading a picture. Yeah, look at that. USB wireless, if you have any. Yeah. Yeah, big facts. All right, now our NIC actually contains something extremely important for our devices, which is our media access control address, or our MAC address. It is a unique identifier for a device, and it's located either on the NIC or the motherboard, in case the motherboard already has the NIC soldered into it. Now, can anyone tell me how many bits are in a MAC address? 48. Yeah, 48. That's right. That's right. Great job. Great job. It's like you reviewed the material for the past two days. It's definitely... Well, no, nope, it's 48. It's definitely 48. I believe it's, uh, it's 16 bits, 16 bits, and 16 bits. Actually, well... If you want to split it up even more, yeah, it is. Yep, math is a little hard. All right, anyways, Ethernet, I'm sure you all have heard that term before, but Ethernet is pretty much the architecture of a network, including our cables, our connectors, and our signaling, and also defines everything about modern network hardware, how it's structured, how all the pins need to be aligned within the devices in order for it to be connected to other network media. Now, whenever we're talking about network media, we're not talking about news channels, social media. We're talking about a medium, but it can also be referred to as network media. Uh, the four different types that we're going to cover later on is going to be coaxial cables, which I'm sure all of you all have had experience with so far. Uh, twisted pair cable, which y'all have also had experience with so far. We also have fiber optics and wireless media. Now, software is the language that the machines on the network use, typically referring to your operating system, certain protocols, the TCP IP suite, and a bunch of other examples. Uh, can anyone give me some examples of software? Some specific examples. Discord. No, not Discord. Discord, what you're thinking of is an application. Microsoft Windows. Which, Microsoft Windows. That's right. We have Windows 10, Windows 7. Any other specific software? Apple? Uh, yeah, Mac. Yeah. Mac. Yeah. yeah, so the list goes on pretty much. And then we have applications, which they are, they are programs that are used to accomplish tasks like accessing shared files or web browsing. Or in this case, Discord would be an application that we're using for what? Apple applications, okay. That's... If only Apple would have came out with that name. Does anyone want to answer the question? Discord would be an application that we're currently using in order to do what? 
communicating and file sharing. Yeah, that's right. We're communicating. We're sharing files. It's pretty straightforward. But it can also be used for, or other applications can be used for other things like word processing. We typically use what application? Can you repeat that one, one more time? No or bad. word processing? We'd use what word? application? Yeah, Microsoft Word. At least Fine, I think I that's what notepad. you said. Did you say Word? <laughs> she said yeah, Word. I said Notepad. Yep. <laughs> you said, well, I mean, Notepad, I mean, you're not wrong. Notepad can be used, too. Uh, and then we have spreadsheets, which we'd use what? Excel. 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 And then we have slide presentations, which we'd use what? PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Google. Yeah, PowerPoint. Y'all are killing it. But the good work. All right, and then just like I mentioned earlier, in order to connect local area networks together, you do have to have wireless or physical media in order to connect them. You also need routers because routers connect networks together based on IP addresses. And you also need IP addresses to identify each one of those devices that are on a network. Raj? Roger. Thanks, Graham. All right. Network components provide intelligent direction so that data can flow within local area networks and between local area networks. Now, typically within local area networks, you're going to be using switches. Um, and whenever it says provides intelligent direction, that means is those devices can identify the specific devices that are connected to it simply by looking at their MAC address for switches and for routers, it would be their IP addresses. Sorry, I'm just waiting for Sarah McCusker to type out his question. Can a router be a switch? Yes. Yes, it can, but not vice versa. You know, so a switch can't be a router, but a router can act as a switch. In fact, on the back of most routers, which is what y'all, whenever, whenever you're usually in your home, you usually connect devices to the back of the router. Those ports are acting as a, as a layer 3 switch, but we're not going to get too deep into that. All right, moving on to topologies, which I'm pretty sure all of y'all discussed in Dolan Hall. There are two main categories of topologies. We have physical and logical topologies. Physical describes how the devices are laid out and connected. Logical topologies describe how the signals travel across the media from one device to another. So in other words, if we were looking at the specific protocols that were used in a topology, would that be physical or logical? Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, if we were looking at the protocols that the devices used in a topology, would that be describing the physical topology or the logical topology? Logical. Yeah, logical. Yeah, it'd be It'd be describing the logical because, like I said, it's describing how the signals travel from one device to another, and protocols define how signals travel from one device to another. Raj? All right, I guess that's a solid Raj. No one else said it. Cool. I'll just be sad now. I'm going to keep this recording. Whoa. Okay, that's fine. I appreciate it. Now for the first topology we're going to cover is a bus topology. All devices connected by one cable used in earlier networks. Break or improper termination can cause reflection and there's a single point of failure. Now what does reflection mean, uh, Dreyer? It's what you don't want. Okay, thanks. But now what does it actually mean? 
Um, what do you What do you think? What How do you think reflections in uh, mirrors work? Um, Let's go with that. I don't really know how to put it into words, but it's basically like, it's like yeah, when the signal gets sent back, like it's being reflected. Yeah, that's yeah, that's pretty much it. The sen- the signal bounces back because of improper termination. Which, whenever that happens, it can cause collisions within that one line that they're all connected to. Which is why you want to have proper termination. Alright, and then we have a ring topology where every computer system is connected together in a complete loop. However, it is still vulnerable to a single point of failure. Now, in order to increase the reliability of a ring topology... um, Someone came up with the idea to make the ring topology actually more reliable. Does anyone know how they could possibly keep the topology a ring topology, but make it more reliable? Anyone? Anyone? No one? Would that be by making like the mesh topology? I didn't know if that was like different than. Or so different so we're still ring. yeah that would be a different topology. We're still wanting to keep it a ring topology, but the only way to make it more reliable is by adding another ring. See if one if the outside cable breaks, the nodes that are still in that topology can still communicate simply by swapping over to the other ring make sense raj 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 all right and then we have the star topology where all devices are connected to a single point or a single device now whenever we're talking about breaks it's referring to breaks in a cable so breaks would only affect one machine for example if we look down at that bottom left hand side oh oh there we go if there was a break in the line that's connecting that center device which is a switch to uh, that top left device labeled host a would the entire network be shut down no no who would be the only device that's affected Anyone? Host A. Yeah, it would just be host A. However, in this topology, there's still a single point of failure. Can let me see. Uh, you said it, it was a a Kone, right? Sir. Um. Can you tell me? where the single point of failure is in the left diagram. In the, the left diagram? Yeah, in the left diagram. Here, I'll zoom in on it. That one. Where's the single point of failure at? Uh, would it just be the switch? Maybe? Yeah, it would be the switch, because if that goes down, none of the devices would be able to communicate. Raj? Raj. 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 I'm digging it. I'm digging it. Alright, and then lastly we have the mesh topology. Connects each node with multiple links, providing multiple paths between any two nodes. As you can see, if we have any breaks in that topology, it's only it's only gonna affect the connection between that computer and the computer that's connected to. Otherwise, it still has multiple paths it can go down in order to reach its destination. Now, out of all of those four, which one do we think is the most reliable? Mesh. Yeah, it'd be a mesh topology. Why would why would it be the uh, most reliable? It has many points. Uh, so- I assume both of y'all just said the same thing. Yeah, it can, even if one line goes down, it can still communicate with all the other devices. 
Now, out of all those topologies, which one seemed the most expensive? Also mesh. mesh. Also the mesh topology, because you're kind of spending an equal amount of money for the equal amount of reliability. Raj? Raj. 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 Copy. All right, now we move into the OSI reference model, which was created by the International Organization of Standardization. I know their acronym says ISO, even though their name is IOS. That's just the name that they went with. Now, this standardized common language for hardware and software. How many layers are in the OSI model class? Seven. seven. That's right, there's seven. Does anyone know a way to remember all seven of them? I don't remember like an acronym, but I remember all seven. That's weird that you remember all seven, but there's no acronym for it that you remember. But that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna go over it at the end of this. I know it starts with people need, but I don't remember the, the end of it. There's no way it could start with people need. That is there's no way. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. It's like, please don't not throw sausage away or something. <laughs> Close, except that you had a double negative in there, but that's okay. We'll uh, we'll go over we'll go over that acronym uh, after the seven layers. So for the first layer, the physical layer it determines two negatives does make a positive. That's right. The physical layer determines how data is placed on the network media and. Things that operate on this layer typically are cabling, our connectors, our hubs, and our NICs, or network interface cards. The data link layer defines the rules for gathering and completing all elements that make up the whole data frame so it could be passed to the physical layer. Specific devices that operate on this layer that we're going to cover in one Bravo most likely tomorrow. The specific devices that operate are the bridges and the switches. Also, I realize I just said that we were going to do it tomorrow. I meant Monday, because tomorrow is Saturday. And I'm sure y'all don't want to spend your Saturday listening to me talk. Now, there are two sub-layers within the data link layer known as the logical link control and the media access control. The logical link controller, LLC, is a sublayer responsible for error correction and flow control. The media access control, or MAC, is responsible for addressing network devices by using the physical address, or MAC addresses. So, if you remember that... MAC addresses operate on layer 2. You can remember that bridges and switches also operate on layer 2 because they use MAC addresses in order to determine where to send information. Raj? Raj. Raj. Solid Raj. And then next up we have the network layer, which is layer 3. Contains our routing functions. Our logical addressing or our IP addressing. And this is the layer that routers operate on. Does anyone know why routers operate on this layer? Because routers use logical addressing. Because routers use logical addressing or IP addressing in order to determine where to direct traffic. Great job, Paul. Proud of you. And then next up, we have the transport layer, which in this layer, fragmentation occurs. 
Now the process of fragmentation is just the breaking up of data into smaller, more manageable chunks for transmission. Now simply put, that's whenever we're transmitting something out. What would happen if we were receiving information? Anyone? We would probably put it back together. We're probably going to put it right back together, or it's the reassembly of data. So whenever we're transmitting data out, it's fragmentation. Whenever we're receiving the data on this layer, this is where it gets reassembled. And then in the session layer, this manages and terminates sessions between programs on devices. For example, some of y'all, or I assume all of y'all, have logged into your bank before, right? Yes? Maybe? Nope. No? Yes. I would hope so. But if you were to log into your bank account online, and you were to, I don't know, not move your mouse for 10 minutes or so, what would happen? It would time you out. It would time you out, or it would terminate your session that you had with that online account? Raj? Raj. 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 All right, and then we have the presentation layer, which manages and translates between the session layer and the application layer. Now, also what occurs in this layer, because of the meaning of translates, that's our encryption decryption. Right, so encryption and decryption occurs in the presentation layer. And then moving on to the last layer, we have the application layer, which represents network-related program code and functions computers need to initiate service requests, while also referring to protocols that programs use, not the programs themselves. So it's not actually referring to applications like Discord or Microsoft Word or Internet Explorer. It's just referring to the actual protocols that are used, like HTTP, FTP, uh, IGP, the list goes on. All of those were specific protocols that I just listed. Any questions so far? Nope. Good so far. Good so far. Okay. Okay. I can dig it. All right. So anyways, in order to remember all seven layers, which, I mean, if you have them all memorized, that's cool. But if you need help remembering all of them in a different manner, you can always go with the please do not throw sausage pizza away. Or you can always go with please do not teach stupid people acronyms. Uh, please do not teach small people acrobats. The, the list goes on. Whatever helps you remember all seven layers. Now we can move on into the TCP IP layers or the TCP IP model. Now upon the development of the TCP IP protocols, the model actually became more widely used in the seven layer OSI model since it is easier to incorporate into TCP IP networks. It is also referred to as the internet model. Now for this one, there are only four layers. However, just like I mentioned earlier, protocols are simply a set of rules that govern the procedures used to exchange information between devices. They help computers communicate with other devices, 
and they're pretty much similar to a language to where they're setting the rules of how data is going to be transferred between devices. All right, now for the very first layer, we have the link slash network interface layer, which makes up layers one and two of the OSI model. And everything that occurs on layers one and two occurs on layer one of the TCP IP model. Contains our physical or our MAC addressing, NICs, switches, bridges, cables, and connectors all operate on this layer. The internet layer, which makes up layer three of the OSI model, otherwise known as what layer class? Network layer. Network. The network layer, that's right. Layer three. It's our IP packet layer, our logical and IP addressing, and routers opera also operate on this layer because they use what? Logical addressing. That's right, or IP addressing. And then on to the third layer, which is the transport layer, makes up layers four and five of the OSI model. It's the assembly and disassembly of data. Remember the whole fragmentation thing I was discussing earlier? It is made up of two very specific protocols that we're going to discuss. We have the connection-oriented protocol, or TCP, which is the transmission control protocol. Requires a stable connection between client and server before the message is sent. Also has our acknowledgments and contains guaranteed data delivery. Now, whenever it says requires a stable connection between client and server before a message is sent, there's a technical term for that. Does anyone know what that term is? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you uh can you repeat the question? What is the technical term for requiring a stable connection between client and server before a message is sent? Connection oriented? Well, I mean it falls under the connection oriented protocol, but I'm talking about there's a there's an actual technical term for it. What do uh what do two people that are meeting each other do whenever they first it's meet? It's a, a handshake. Yeah, there's a handshake. That's right. The server and the client have to have a handshake, meaning the client sends a request to the server. The server's like, "Hey, I got you." That's the handshake. I have seen this in Wireshark, and I'm pretty sure I might have a picture of it. Sound like a parody would sync it. Yeah, yeah, this sounds about right. Um, but I might be able to attach an image that shows the exact acknowledgments along with synchronization but uh, I'll get into that later on. The other specific protocol in the transport layer is the connectionless oriented protocol or UDP where the system will send information without verifying someone is on the other end to receive it. So in UDP there's no handshake. They just uh, as the kids say they send it Right? Is that what is that what they're saying, Graham? Sometimes, I think. Sometimes. <laughs> I don't use it. What's that, Paul? He's yeah, what's that? One to ask. Okay. Okay. Wow. Like I said, they just send it. And there's also no guarantee of data delivery. So for me. For me to remember at least which one's connection oriented and which one's connectionless, I always think that the T in TCP stands for touching or forming a connection. 
But that's just me. Whatever helps you remember which protocol is which. All right, and then lastly, we have the application layer, which combines all three of the top layers of the OSI model and their functions, and also uses ports to give each application a unique number that identifies the protocol it uses. More specifically, we're only going to cover three uh, common application layer protocols. We have HTTP, which is the protocol that makes web pages work and uses port 80. Where have we seen HTTP at? Websites. Typically URL. in your URL or in your address bar, that's right. And then we have FTP or file transfer protocol, which is a protocol that transfers files between clients and servers while using ports 20 and 21. And then we also have simple mail transfer protocol, which is typically used to send electronic mail on the internet and uses port 25. And that's a comparison of the TCP IP model and the OSI model. Now, does anyone have a way of remembering the TCP IP model, or at least remembering all four layers? Because if no one does, I have a very, very simple and cringy way of remembering all four layers. Go for it. Send it. I sent it. It was sent. And if anyone didn't see what I just typed, it's in the uh, 20020 chat. Uh, L-I-T-A, it's, uh, lit, airman. Y'all, y'all get it. Link slash network interface layer. Rush. The internet layer, the transport layer, and then the application layer. That's pretty lit. That is pretty lit. Everyone still good with the, uh, video? Rush. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Now we talk about the network media, which all of y'all have already gone over in the in the past, especially in Dolan. We have the coax cable consisting of a center conductor surrounded by an insulating material and a concentric outer conductor. Uh, is original cabling used in Ethernet networking. There's also two specific types of connectors for it. What are those two? Um, and um, how do you say it? Angeli. Angeli. What are those two connectors? Without uh, looking at your study guide work. C and F type. Ah, you looked in your you looked in your uh, study guide workbook, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. Yeah, well, at least you admitted it. That's all that matters. Yeah, the BNC and F type connector. Y'all made a BNC connector in Dolan, so I'm pretty sure you know how it still worked. However, the F type connector, where do we typically see that? Like, where have we seen that cable laying around at? Televisions. Oh, yeah, no, we're not going to cover in type. This is more just for IP networking um, cabling. But there is an in type, which, yeah, it's, it's F type. F type. Like fiber. No, no, not, not like fiber. It's just F type. Not F O. But just F. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm not. Let's wait for an extra. I'll I'll explain later on. But the F type connector that y'all have, or at least that you see inside of your homes, uh, yes, you can plug it back in or into the back of a television. At least with those that still have that connection on there. But then you can also connect it to the back of a specific network device, and I'm sure a lot of y'all have done this in the past. Does anyone know what network device that would be? 
A modem? Yeah, a modem. That's right. That's all it is. Raj. Raj. Which is still what is used today to provide our broadband internet. And next up we have the twisted pair cable, which is the most commonly used network media for IP networking, which consists of two copper wires twisted together over their lengths. Hence the name Twisted Pair. Everyone see that? Raj. Uh, Raj. Martin, I, I saw that you like unmuted yourself, and I'm guessing that you were going to say Raj. Yes. Okay, cool. Appreciate it. Now, there are two specific types of Twisted Pair. We have UTP, or Unshielded Twisted Pair, and then we have STP, or Shielded Twisted Pair. For UTP, it doesn't have the metallic shielding, while Shielded Twisted Pair does contain a metal foil surrounding the pair of wires in order to prevent any type of interference. Now, which one would be more expensive? Shielded Twisted Pair. The Shielded Twisted Pair, because you're paying for more material. It's that simple. Alright, and then the one connector that we're going to discuss for twisted pair cables is going to be the RJ45 connector, which is typically used in modern networks. Y'all might see things like an RJ11, which was used like way back in the day for landlines. I mean, the list goes on. Now, there are two specific wiring standards. For this, we have T568-Alpha, and we have T568-Bravo. Alpha simply provides the guidance on how to make twisted pair cabling into an RJ45 connector. It's a very specific color coordination for each pin. T568-Bravo is similar to Alpha, however, wires 2 and 6 are switched. And wires 1 or 3 are switched. This standard is most commonly used in America. The way I like to remember it is we're using version B. Because B stands for better. And we're better than everyone else. Raj? Raj. Raj. Solid Raj. Copy. Now there are several different types of configurations. When it sounded like a Texas quote. Well, you're not wrong. But I had to apply it to America. Now the three different types of cable configurations we're going to cover are the straight through cable, crossover, the rollover, and the loopback. For the straight through cables, the pins on both ends of the cable match. Typically used to connect a computer to a switch, or in other words, in order to connect two devices that aren't the same together. Yes. Makes sense? I feel like it makes sense. Oh, sorry, Young left us? Alright, well, sorry, Young left us, I guess. So in other words, for a straight through cable, if we have T568 alpha on one end, we're going to have T568 alpha on the other end. For a crossover cable, this is where we have the transmit and the receive pins swapped on both ends. So in other words, we might have T568 alpha on one side. But on the other side, we have what standard? Bravo. Yeah, we'd have T568 Bravo crosses over to the other standard. Hence the name, the crossover cable. Raj? Raj. 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 And then Raj. we have the rollover cable, which 
is also known as a console cable, but if you were to take the connector, or at least one end of the cable, and you were to roll it over, it would match the other end. But in other words, they're completely mirrored from what the other end is. Just like it says there, pins are exactly opposite on the ends of the cable. A rollover cable is used in order to connect the administrator system to the console port of a Cisco router or switch. Now most switches or routers or most network devices in general typically have a console port that you can use your rollover cable for. Any questions? Nope. Nope. Thanks, Graham. Graham speaking for the whole class. What's up, Papa? All right, and then lastly, we have the loopback cable, which only has one RJ45 connector. Typically, all that's going to happen with this connector is we're going to have one of those cables going from pin 1 to pin 3. And another cable connecting pin 2 to pin 6. And what that's going to allow us to do, it's going to allow us to troubleshoot the pins on our network device by conducting a loopback test. So in other words, just like it says on the screen, wires connect the transmit pins to the receive pins on the same system. And loops or loopbacks are always used, or at least typically used, for troubleshooting a system. Any questions? No, sir. She had it. All right, now we can move into the several different categories, which I'm sure all of y'all have mostly heard of Cat5 or Cat5e. Mm -hmm. But prior to those, we did have Cat1, Cat3. Uh, Cat1 offered one megabit speed and is used for telephone voice, not for data communications. We had Cat3 offering 10 megabits uh, per second. And then Cat5 offering 100 megabits per second. And moving into Cat5e, or actually, does anyone know what the E stands for? Anyone? Extra. Not extra, it's... Express? No. Anyone else? stands for enhanced cat5 enhanced because it's a better version of the normal cat5 offering one gigabit speed and then we have cat6 or cat6 alpha which offers 10 gigabits per second any questions over the different types of cables for twisted pair. Anyone? Sir. All right, I'm looking up this cool video to uh, post in y'all's resources. I don't want it to play. Let me let me post it in there. Well, bam. All right, moving on. Now we can talk about one of the, or actually the fastest network media that we do have to offer is. Optical fiber. 
It's extremely expensive and really, and I mean extremely expensive to get it installed too. Um, it does require a lot of expertise whenever it comes to the installation, mostly because fiber optic is extremely brittle if it's not a, how do I put this, if it's not constructed in a manner made for extreme uh, environments it can be extremely brittle. So, does anyone know why it's extremely brittle? It has glass in it, a lot of glass. Yeah, it's, it's made up of really small strands of glass, which enable it to send traffic from one end to the other. Uh, it's really good for long distance, and it's extremely great for high speeds. Um, probably within the next, I don't know, I want to say decade or so, you're going to see a lot more uh, company or a lot of companies actually offering fiber optic internet rather than uh, the normal method that they do now. I know at and is really starting to kick it up around uh, this area at least. Now there are two different types of fiber optic cables. We have multi-mode. And single mode, multi mode is more commonly used mostly because it is easier to send multiple signals down rather than just one signal. So, if we take a look at the bottom right, if we look at the top one, that top image, and compare it down to the bottom image, which one? can contain more signals. The top one. The top one, because why? Why is it able to uh, There's contain more signals? Light paths. There's multiple light paths for the signals to distribute to. Exactly. Yeah, there's exactly. There's a larger diameter. Because there's a larger diameter. There's a thicker glass core, or a thicker core glass, however you want to say it, uh, whenever you compare it to the single mode, which can only hold one signal. Here's the thing, though, because single mode is thinner, it can actually send that signal further than multi-mode cable. Does that make sense? Raj. Raj. Because it's more concentrated over that thinner core rather than the uh, thicker core of multi-mode. Raj. Okay. And then we have the types of connectors concerning fiber optics. We have the straight tip or the stick and twist because it provides the same exact operation as a BNC copper connector. Does everyone know what that means by the BNC copper connector? It performs the same functions. You still have to twist and lock the connector onto the connection. Raj? Raj. 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 And then we have the subscriber connector. Connectors have a square molded plastic body and a push pull locking feature. And if you watch that video, which y'all can watch it uh, whenever, uh, it does show you the two connectors for it. I think it's more towards the end of the video that they show the straight tip and the uh, subscriber connectors. And then next up, we have wireless media types. Uh, typically, the standard for this is introduced by IEEE 802.11, which provides the standards for all wireless media. Don't worry, we're going to cover that whenever we get to uh, wireless local area network fundamentals here in a couple of objectives. Utilizes RF and infrared devices to transmit and receive data without the use of wires. And in order for 
wireless networks to operate properly, you have to have wireless access points, typically called WAPs. Any questions so far? All good. All good. I said WAP, W-A-P. All right, well, um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to go on break for, uh, go 10 minutes. Go 10 minutes. 10 minute break. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'm, I still got to wait for everyone, but that's okay. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, I'm back, man. Nice. I think. I find it funny, I still keep getting these Motorola auto notifications from the trunking server at Fairchild. Nice. That's so every time weird. I get them I send them to you guys in block five. So you can show your students what it actually looks like when you get a notification from the trunk going down. It'd be like that. Yeah. It'd be I, like I think that it's a good real sometimes. world example for them. I've been sending them to Boudreaux and I think he's used them a couple times in his class to kind of show them what's happening. So, uh, did you know that Discord actually does, like, video chats now? Yeah, man. I was doing that earlier. Yeah, no, I didn't, uh, I didn't know it was yeah, actually doing video chats, too. Yeah, you literally just have to click the too. video section, and then you can do that. And I think you can yeah. do it with multiple, too, but I'm not sure. You can also record video on OBS, but I can teach you about that later if you want. Maybe. But, Maybe. uh, your recording sounds really good so far. I'm going to try and figure out how to mash the slides in there. I realized I could have been scrolling through them on my screen this entire time had I had more time to... Oh, because you're up. recording your screen right now. Right, so it, it's yeah. already set up to capture a PDF on my screen. Raj. But Raj. I didn't have the slides open and going through them while you were doing it. Makes sense. So Makes I'm going to have to go back in there later and add them, but it should be pretty easy. Eight, nine. But I'll get the audio uploaded for you first, and so your students can re-listen to that, and then I'll, I'll add the slides later. Raj. All right, where's everyone at? There should be uh, there should be eleven people total in the uh, in the stream, and I only see eight. Are you planning on finishing up around eleven? Um, to be honest. Maybe 11.30-ish. Because IPv4, okay. or at least explaining subnets and whatnot, because I think what I'm probably going to okay, have so them I do is... I didn't miss that yet. No, 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 oh, you haven't. Good. Yeah, IPv4 is just a little rough because people tend to get lost on subnetting. Yeah. No, I, I'm right there with you, man. I have to relearn it every single time someone talks about it. Them. But the Net Plus book is actually um No, that book you guys have is pretty good. I think it's actually the same hard copy one that I have that I used to study for the exam in 2011. It's most likely the same one. Yeah, it looks like it looks like the same book. Yeah, the the Security Plus one was better, but that that Net Plus book, man, that's that's a lot of reading. <laughs> I thought that test was way more harder. Let me see. 
I don't know. A lot of people feel that that one's easier, but I definitely think it was harder. That's great, though, that you all give these guys that book. I love that they like, don't copy it, Sergeant? and people copy yeah, what's it anyway. Uh, what time? You said you're going to finish by 11.30? Okay. Probably 11.30. You guys have to go to lunch? Is that why? Yes. So I mean, that's why I was going to tell you. Defects open until 1.30, you know? Okay. You got time. You got time. I know, Grab I know you might be something. You might be a little hungry, but... um, you Have some of your Q snacks is what my... my Brothers, my uh, my nephew is calling them. I got pizza, Q, so Q I'm snacks. chilling for now. Okay. Yeah, that's your quarantine well, uh, snacks, sir. Offer. That's what Q snacks we're just, are. Oh, quarantine yeah, snacks. You call them Q See, snacks. me, it's usually Q like snacks. a giant bag of Doritos. Yeah, whatever it is, man. He's, and he's, I he's feel a little, a little bad like because I think I'm calling, <laughs> calling them Q snacks, and I love it. I can't tell you how many bags of Doritos I've gone through. Yeah, I'm going to have to figure out how to cut this part of the recording up. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, y'all act like you haven't eaten five bags of Doritos before. Um, in one sitting? No, man. I I don't think I've. Oh, I mean, that. I haven't had I haven't five in that. one sitting. Yeah, I'm talking five across. Yeah. I don't know, a couple yeah, weeks. I'm not a. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, <laughs> sorry, I got distracted by by me? food. Someone brought up yeah. lunch. Yeah, I usually let them go at eleven. But yeah, if you if you're gonna start back up with them at one, just let me know so I can record this at a later time. No, I'll probably finish up because I gotta head in and do some shelter management stuff later oh, on. Oh boy! Yep, super fun. I appreciate you. Is, all right, is everyone in here now? Uh, we're still missing. Wait, Marito's online. Marito. Oh man, whoever's crunching, please mute your mic so we don't hear you please. crunching. <laughs> Thank you. Much better. Well, if Marito's not going to join, I believe we have everyone in here then. I mean, I want to give that guy a compliment because obviously he has a very good microphone if he can pick up the crunching. But at the same time, I don't want to hear it. I feel that. I feel that. All right. Now we can move into IPv4 addressing. Yeah. Super fun stuff. There's a lot of numbers. People are probably going to get lost, but that's I'm okay. Because I'm here to help. Now, IPv4. Whenever we're talking about IPv4, this is typically referring to our IP address for our devices on our network. It's also known as our logical address, just like we were saying with the routers, right? Because routers use IP addresses. And IPv IPv4 addresses contain 32 bits. That's a lot of bits, right? Am I right? Anyone? It's not that many bits. It's only 32. But if we take a look at the... Example that we have here where it says 75.110.227.18, right? That's written in dotted decimal format. What's Is up, Paul? Is the stream still on the, the network plus? No, frame? no, I should, be, I should be on the... Um... It, it just went back. Hey, it's you back just changed slide, it though. on mine, too. It, it switched back and forth. Oh, that's, that's yeah, weird. So if you click on the other one up top, we can see that. You see where it says yeah. down to you? So that's all we were seeing. Oh, I wonder why it didn't... Okay, now, is everyone on the slides now? Yes. Yeah, you're selected. Well, yes. Okay, that's that was... Now, that's why. I didn't know... I didn't realize that there was a lag if I didn't click yeah, back into the... Yeah, there's a little bit the, uh... if you don't click on it. That makes sense. Because on my screen, I had it back yeah, on. I'm sure it looked uh, great on your screen. On it did. It did. I was killing it. Uh, anyways... In this example, which I'm about to highlight, so I hope everyone can see it, 75.110.227.18, right? That's in dotted decimal format, which we convert over from the binary format, which in binary format, you're going to see all 32 bits. And because it's in binary, we're only going to see it in 
we're only going to see two characters for each value, or at least one of one of two characters for each bit. Uh, what are those two values? Zero and one. Zero and once. That's it. Only zeros and ones. Hence the name. Um, hold up. I'm just trying to highlight the, yeah, the like B don't, and the I. Don't, don't roll anyway, off this there it is. By, right? Meaning two, which is referring to zeros and ones. Everyone copy? Uh, Raj. Copy. Raj. Raj. All right. So each group is known as an octet. Which is referring to every 8 bits of an IP address. And there are always going to be 4 octets in an IP address. Now let's do some quick maths. Nope. There's 8 bits per octet, right? Hmm. There are 4 octets. What's 4 times 8? 32. 32. Oh my gosh. Y'all figured it out. Great job. say 24. So great. No, it's not 24. <laughs> it's 32. 32 bits, right? Because, right, right here we have 8 bits in the first octet. In the second octet, we have another 8 bits. Third octet, another 8 bits. Fourth octet, another 8 bits. 4 times 8, 32. Pretty simple, right? Now, each one of these bits contains a certain value. For example, if we look at this first octet, 01001011. And we were to convert that over to dotted decimal, it would represent 75. Can anyone tell me why? Sure can. That's, that's how the, the conversion to, from binary to decimal works. I mean, do you want what me to explain mean, how? Aaron Green, please explain it to me, because I do not get it. I am being serious. Well, you, kinda, you take each, like, uh, Do I go from number. left to right or right to left? Right to left, in in terms of like what place you're working with. So like in mm -hmm. decimal, you have like the tens place and the hundreds place. Wait, what? With binary, you have like the ones place, the twos place, the fours place, and it goes up in powers of two each time instead of powers of ten. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty good explanation. So zero 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 zero. So zero, if we take a one, look, Sergeant McCusker is two. All zeros would obviously equal... Oh, jeez, I didn't realize that that... Okay. Oh Anyways, if we take a look, all 8 bits of zero obviously is going to equal zero. Yeah, I can do that one. And if we look at the next one, where it has okay. seven zeros followed by a one, well, this value right here for this bit is worth one. What? So if it's in the one position it's going to equal 1. So is there always 8 numbers? Yes, there's always going to be 8 bits. Not any more, not any less. There's always okay. going to be 8 bits. So in this example, for the next one... Oh, we have Airman Morito in here. I hope I said that right. Did I say that right, class? If not, they're going to call him that from now on, or her. That's true. Him. Okay, well, I hope I said that properly. Sorry mm -hmm. if I butchered your name. But if we take a look at this next example, we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Oh, goodness. Which equals a value of 2, because if we take a look, like I said, each place holds a certain value. This very first one holds a value of 128. What? This next one is 64. What? Can anyone guess what this one is? 32. 32. 32. That's yeah! right. And then moving on to the next one, which would be what? Not 24. Not 20. 16. No, it's, it'd be 16. The next one would obviously be 8. eight four, and then 4. Two. And then two, and then one. Oh, I got this! So got my certificate. <laughs> I can't do that. I'm sorry. All right. 
So, if it's a 1, then that value gets added to all the other values, right? Now, which bit determines whether the number is odd or even? The eighth one. The four, yeah, the eighth the one. This very last one because it's worth one. If you add up the first seven bits starting on the left hand side, all of those are even numbers. So if you see all of those followed by a zero, it's going to be an even number. If you see any of these followed by a one, it's going to be odd. Makes sense, right? Yeah. And so the value of an octet can range from what to what? Zero, zero to, 255. to 255. Zero to 255. That's oh man, right. I am crushing this now. You are crushing it. I feel so good. All right, can everyone see the uh, slideshow again? Yes, sir. Yes. Cool. Now, if we take a look, the second val or I'm sorry, this uh, this first octet. We'll do the first octet. We see we have zero one zero zero one zero one one, right? Well, we know that this bit is worth how much? Sixty four. It's worth sixty four. Okay, and then we move on to the next one. How much is this one worth? Sorry, hold it. There it is. I highlighted it now. Eight. That one's worth eight. And then... <laughs> nailed it. These last two bits are equal to what? Three together. Three. Yeah, I mean, if you put them together, they equal three. So we have 64 plus eight, which is 72. Plus the three, we get 75. Do I need to go through and do the rest of the octets, or is that pretty easy to understand? I'd prefer if you didn't, so I could do it on my own. Okay, okay. But that, anyone that's else up to the rest of your class? Anyone pretty else need easy. me t to go through the rest, or it's pretty easy to understand, right? Yeah, remember it I'll, mostly. I'll get back to you when I turn it in. <laughs> cool. I'll grade it. Yeah, please do. So remember, if you see all 32 bits, all zeros and ones, it's in binary format. If you see the numbers that have been converted over, for in other words, if you don't see all 32 bits and you see numbers similar to this, anything ranging from 0 to 255, it is in dotted decimal format. Does everyone see the difference between the two? Yes. That's one person saying yes. I feel like that answers it for the entire class. Yes. Raj. 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 All right. Now if we take a look at this example here, we have 172.16.100.48. Obviously, it's in dotted decimal format because it's not in zeros and ones. You see the numbers after they've already been converted. I said that there were four octets, right? We have one, two, three, and four. There's eight bits per octet, right? Because oct referring to eight. Uh, four times eight is what? 32. 32, great job, Paul. Gold star. Now, whenever you're working in an IPv4 network, or at least working with a network that uses IPv4 addressing, or with any type of uh, internet protocol version, you can't have any duplicate IP addresses on a network. Does anyone know why? Anyone? If I had two of the same IP Doesn't addresses... Does that cause like a collision or something? Or an error? Well, not necessarily a collision, but more of an error because the device isn't going to know yeah, it can't where to send the it. data to. Right? right. Hence isn't why, that why you can't give yeah. two routing protocol addresses to the same device. Yeah. 
Okay. I wasn't sure if that's what you were referring to or not. I'm starting to remember this stuff, man. Yeah. So each range, just like we already discussed earlier, because y'all figured out the quick maths, each range can value or go from 0 to 255. Now let me bring up some... Let me see, let me see. We have... We have subnet mask. I'm going to need cider classes of IP addresses. All right. Does everyone see the slides right now? Sure. I assume everyone does. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, class licenses. All IP addresses can fall within a certain class license, which ultimately determines the subnet mask for a or for an IP address. Uh, class A addresses have the first octet ranging from 1 to 126. Class B has the first octet ranging from 128 to 191. Class C has it ranging from 192 to 223. Class D is 224 to 239. And class E is 240 to 254. Now, like I said, all you have to do is take the value of the very first octet, and that'll tell you what class license an IP address falls into. Raj? What kind of experimental slash research things would be used for class E? I forgot to ask you that the last time you were teaching this class, and I'm sorry if this kind of goes off on a tangent for the rest of y'all. No, you're good. What was the question? So what kind of things would be used for experimental slash research? Like, is that how they tested out the IPv6 stuff? Or uh, can you expand a be little honest, more? Be honest, can you be I haven't had too much experience with Class E addressing at all. Okay, I'll just do some research on my own then. Rutch. Thanks, I appreciate it. Anytime. So if we take a look and I attach this website inside the student resources, it's the one that's labeled uh, classes of IP addresses. If everyone does want to open it, if you don't want to and you just want to follow along with what's on the screen right now, you can. Right, so it defines five classes of addresses, like we already said, A, B, C, D, and E. Um, the ranges on this website in comparison to what we have on the slides uh, there's one thing that's a little different about it, but we're going to cover it right now. Does everyone see the slides? Raj. Raj. Okay, so anyways, if we take a look, we see that we have Class A going from 1 to 126, Class B going from 128 to 191. Well, hold up. What's missing right now? 127. 127. Does anyone know what 127 is used for? ID. That's holding the net ID, right? I'm sorry, what was that, Sarah McCusker? Is that the network ID? No. Or the host ID, whatever it's called? Nope. Dang it. Anyone? Dang it. 120. Oh, what's up, Prol? Oh, I said I couldn't tell you. You couldn't tell me, okay. Martin, you looked like you wanted to say something. Nope. Okay, all right, never mind. I guess I was wrong. 127 is our loopback address. That's the reason why it's not located, or that's the reason why it's not labeled on this. 127 is a way of pinging your own computer to ensure your transmit and receive is working properly. Raj? Raj. 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 I, I literally Raj. missed that. Can you repeat that one more time? What 127 is for? So 127 is used as a loopback address. Oh, it's a loopback address. Yeah, okay. loopback address. Typically used for troubleshooting a system. So if we move into the next slide, which I assume everyone can see right now. So what is the uh, host shows ID some and the net ID stuff then? We'll get into network ID oh, and host okay, okay. ID. Here in a the little bit. All right, go ahead. Sorry. The example that's provided for class A, we see that it's 10.10.10.1. .10 .10 .1. 
The uh, reason it falls into class A is because we look at the very first octet and we see that it's 10. 10 falls into the range of 1 to 126, making it a class A address. Following along so far, everyone? Sir, Raj. Yep. Class B, we see the example is 172. 172 falls in between 128 and 191, making it a class B address, correct? Raj. Appreciate it. And so on and so forth with all the other examples. Now there are two different types of IP addresses. And this is extremely important to know whenever you're looking at the class licenses. Is determining whether an IP address is class full or class less. Now class full IP addresses are addresses without subnet IDs. Now, what does that mean particularly? Well, in order to understand what that means, we have to know what a subnet mask is. Simply put, a subnet mask is a value used to help devices distinguish the host network. So if we take a look, class A has a default subnet mask of 255.0.0.0. Class B has a default subnet mask of 255.255.0.0. Class C has three octets of 255, followed by the last one being a zero. And class D and E both have 255.255.255.255. Raj? Raj. Following Raj. along so far? Raj. Okay, cool. Now, if we all take a look, we said that the subnet mask is the value used to help devices distinguish the host network. So if we take a look at this example right here, which I assume everyone can see kind of clearly. Yes? Sure. No? Maybe? Uh, we see in the very top line, that would be our IP address, right? If we all look at the binary format, um, it's then converted over on the right side of the picture to 10.0.0.1. What class license does that make that IP address then? Class A. Class A. Makes it class A because 10 falls in between 1 to 126. Therefore, the default subnet mask would be what? Five five dot zero zero zero. Yeah, two five five dot zero dot zero dot zero. And if we take a look, they've lined up the binary format of both addresses, right? We have the IP address on the very top, and then we have the subnet mask right below it, correct? Correct. Right. Now that very bottom line is determining our network ID because that is what the subnet mask does. Now does everyone see that all the for the subnet mask all those ones, the first eight bits are all one. Yeah, that means it's 255. Yeah, that so for our subnet a, mask. Right? Yeah. That represents the network ID Nailed. for an IP address. So that means our network ID for that IP address of 10.0.0.1 means that our network ID is 10.0.0.0. Raj? Raj. Raj. Making what? sense so far to everyone? Yeah, so the only clarifying yeah, thing that I have is like, does that mean whichever the first octet would be? that the network ID would just be that first octet, just defining that that's the or a work here within? For a uh, class A address, yes. Is that because you added 8 and 2 and got 10? Am I tracking correctly? No. What? What? Oh, oh are you asking for, like, yeah. how did... I was asking oh. where the 10 came from, isn't it? Yeah, the 10, and, the 10 comes eight, from... 10? Do you see what I'm highlighting on my screen right yeah. now? Yeah. Isn't okay, zero, so, one zero, um, isn't that two, and then you add ten, right? Yeah, or two and eight there's one zero, added one together. Zero just... 
ten. Uh zero 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 one zero one zero is ten. Oh, okay. So I just thought you were supposed to add them. My bad. Well no, you did I mean you added them together. You added oh, okay, the so I eight. still did it right. Yeah, you add the Woo! eight and the and the two. Crush and that it. equals ten. So for the default subnet mask, all the ones that are here are going to represent the network ID. So let's move on to another example. We can look right here at this address. And we see that our network ID is used to differentiate networks from one another. In other words, it identifies the network that a device is connected to. In this example, it says 202.120.10.x. Let's replace that x with any random number. I don't care what number you want to pick. We'll say that it's 17, right? 202.120.10.17. Well, what class license does that IP address fall under? Anyone? Class C. Falls into a class C address because 202 falls in between 192 and 223. Therefore, the default subnet mask for a class C address is what? 255.255.255.255.255. That's right. There we go. Okay, now that I'm not lost anymore. Man, I'm so glad so, the other people in your class are smart. Yeah, I know. They're, they're, uh, there's some smart ones. So, so the uh, last octet would be the only one assigned the zero for the network ID? Yeah, that's right. Because the, for example, if I had the subnet mask underneath it, or if I were to convert this all over to binary, right? How many ones would there be for the subnet mask? Eight of them. For 255.255.255.0? Oh, that would be 24. Yeah, that'd be the first 20, that'd be... Did I really miss my opportunity to say 24? Yep. I'm so sad right now. Right? That's, I just typed it in the chat in case anyone's wondering where I'm typing this in at. Um, that would mean that the first three octets represent our what? Anyone? Network ID. That represents the network ID. All of those ones, the subnet mask, determines our network ID. However many ones those are, or however many ones there are, that is what's going to be our network ID from our IP address. ID, that now, determines the class, correct? Well, what determines the class license for an IP address is the value in the first octet. Make sense, Sarah McCusker? Maybe. I'm tracking. So, so 202.120.10.17. 202 falls into the range of a Class C address because I believe it's 192 to 223. Making our default subnet mask 255.255.255.0. In other words, the first 24 bits are in the 1 position. And I said that our subnet mask is what determines our network ID. So that means that the first three octets represent our network ID. Hence why it says in the slideshow right here that the network ID for the address of 202.120.10.17 would be 202.120.10.0.
So Raj, if it was a class B address, it would only be the first two octets? Yes, that's right. If it was a class B address, the first 16 bits, because remember, our subnet mask would be 255.255.0.0, which means that the first 16 bits would represent our network ID. For a class A address, that would be only the first 8 bits representing our network ID. Raj? Raj. 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 Sounds like everyone's tracking. Whoa. However, I know someone's not tracking. There's always, there's always at least like two or three people, and that's okay. Is anyone not tracking right now? I'm assuming not. Now's your, now's your time to shine. Anyone? Okay, we're going to press on then. Now, with our network ID, it can't be assigned to a specific computer or device. A specific computer or a device that's on a network is going to get assigned the host ID. Now, in that previous example of 202.120.10.17, the 17 would represent our host ID, right? Because our subnet mask, like I said earlier, the ones would represent our network ID, but all the zeros would represent our host ID. Raj? Raj. Raj, would it be called um, the, for the host ID? I assume you could represent that with like 0 .0 0 .0 0 0.0.0.1. Would that also? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mask? So, so for that specific example, for 202.120.10.17, our host ID would look like. I'll type it in the chat. Raj. Raj. Jimmy, you had something to say? No? Yes? No? I'm guessing not. Okay. We'll just, uh... Took off the headset. Oh, okay, alright. I see. I see. I'll do that. Aaron Morito? Nothing? We all good? I guess we're all oh, good. Gosh. All right, so the host ID is the portion of the IP address to get specific host information for that part of the network. In other words, it identifies the specific device on the network. All right, so um, if y'all were to bring up your IP addresses on your laptops, and take a look at your IP addresses, I guarantee you that you can figure out what your network ID would be and your host ID. But now we can kind of move into... Actually, I can go over... I've already gone over the portion with the subnet mask. We talked about the classes of licenses. Now we can talk about... Subnet IDs. So y'all remember whenever I was talking about class full IP addresses? Yes. Maybe. No. Yes. Yes. Remember so far that we've only talked about two parts of an IP address. We talked about the network ID and the host ID. In a class full IP address, you're only going to have those two parts. In a class less IP address, you're going to have a subnet ID, which is used for dividing a network into subnetworks. So, for example, we have 10.168.25.202. Well, what class license does that fall under? C. 
falls under class A, right? Because 10 is in between 1 and 126. Making our default subnet mask, which I assume everyone in here knows what the default subnet mask for a class A address is now, is 255.0.0.0. However, as a network administrator, you can go in and program the subnet mask to be different than what the default is. So, for example, in this scenario, we have 255.0.0.0. But our provided subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. Well, those obviously don't match, correct? Correct. Well, let's take a look. Our default subnet mask is still going to tell us our network ID for this IP address. So what would the network ID be for this IP address? be 10.0.0.0 that's right 10.0.0.0 remember that's what our default subnet mask gets us well how is our default subnet mask and our provided subnet mask different the the network id with the provided subnet mask would be 10.168.25.0 okay close close for the default subnet mask, it's 255.0.0.0. We said that our network ID would be 10.0.0.0. The provided subnet mask we see is different because we have an additional 16 bits added on to our subnet mask. So we have 255.255.255.0. Well, we take a look here. And we take a look here and we see that we have an additional 16 bits. Those 16 bits or whatever is different from our provided subnet mask compared to our default subnet mask is going to represent our subnet ID. Raj? Raj. Raj. So in other words, the subnet ID for this IP address would in fact be... 0.168.25 Right. feel like I may have lost some people because uh, or, or they're just not paying attention it's one of the two well it's kind of just showing us the difference between the provided subnet mask and the default subnet mask so you, you would put the 0 at the beginning because the 10 is already yeah. within the default or the network ID yeah I think people are getting pretty hungry. It's lunchtime. Well, we got another 24 minutes, and then I gotta get dressed for work, anyways. So let's take a look. Now, whenever we end up with a subnet ID, we're gonna have a classless IP address. Like I said, it's just an IP address that uses subnets. Okay, and one way of understanding the subnet mask is through classless interdomain routing or our CIDR notation. Otherwise, it's just a shorthand for a subnet mask. So, how many bits are inside of a subnet mask? D2. I'm sorry? 32? Yeah, that's right. There's 32 bits, right? Well, if you take a look at this IP address that we had right here, what's so different about this IP address? You got the slash 24 at the end? Yeah, we have a slash 24 on the end. Now this, now this number can be different than just 24. Don't just think that, oh, it can only be slash 24. No. This is representing how many ones or how many or I mean I guess that's correct how many ones are in our subnet mask so in other words the first 24 bits starting from the very left side of our subnet mask are in the one position now if I were to convert that over to 
dotted decimal, what would that equal? 192.168.25, and then you'd have the dot zero, I think, right? Okay, wait, hold up, hold up. Let me let me type it in the chat. Right, that's what slash twenty four represents. So let me let me edit this. Um, so does everyone see that message I just posted in the uh, twenty chat? Yes. Sir. yes. That slash 24 is telling us that the first 24 bits are in the 1 position. So if we were to convert that over to dotted decimal, what would that equal? 255.255.255.0. Yeah, that's right. So if I had a slash 16, what would that equal? 255.255.00. Okay, what about slash 8? 255.0.0.0. Yeah. What about slash 32? All 255. All 255, that's right. Yeah, the slash 16, that's what that would equal, Sarah McCusker. Just the first 24, I'm sorry, the first 16 bits would be in the one position. The other 16 bits would be zeros. All right, so everyone's kind of following along. That's good. So does that 24 represent the uh, provided subnet? Yes. Now, however, the, sometimes the provided subnet mask might match the default subnet mask. In this example, we have 192.168.25.202.24. Okay, hold up. First off, how do we determine our class license? The first octet. Look at the first octet. We see 192. What class license does that fall into? Class B. Are we sure about no, class C, B? C, C. It's class does it start, C. Does that one start at 192? Yes, it starts out at 192. Don't worry, I have a Raj. good way of remembering all of the class licenses, or at least the values. I'll share that with y'all here in a bit. Um, but yes, 192 means that it's a class C address. Well, what's the default subnet mask for a class C address? 255.255.255.0. Yeah, that's right. 255.255.255.0. Wait, hold up. What does slash 24 equal? Same. It equals the same exact thing, meaning that our default and our provided subnet mask match, making it a classful or classless address. It's only classless when they don't match? Yeah, it's only classless when they don't match. So if we take a look, a class A address, does everyone see the uh, web page that I'm showing? Yes. If everyone takes a look, the class full subnet mask for a class A address is slash 8. For a class B, the class full subnet mask is slash 16. Class C, is slash 24. You're never really going to deal with D or E, but mostly because you can't have a value for the provided subnet mask that is less than the default subnet mask. So, for example, if I had uh, the IP address that we were working with earlier, 192.168.25.202. Ooh, I'll take a look at that. In a second, sorry, McCusker. But so far, those look... Yeah, those look good. Well, actually, uh, the one that says 126.123.23.1. Um, that one is incorrect. Oh, I thought, oh, I thought you filled them out. I'm like, come on, you can do, you can do it. Anytime, anytime. But, like I was saying, sometimes our CIDR notation can actually match the default subnet mask, but it's never going to be less. So with this example, 192.168.25.202, I can't have anything less than slash 24. Does that make sense? 
this yes no maybe That's so one the, person. the provided subnet mask can only if you're going to change it, it can only be the same or higher than the default yes what you're saying yes so ultimately i could do 192.168.25.202 Slash twenty five. Okay. Although that, that, to... that actually that wouldn't make any sense because of the uh, third octet, but we're not going to get too deep into that. Are we going to have to know why we would change? Well, yeah. The, so the reason you would change a default subnet mask is for subnetting. Okay, and subnetting is a little difficult to understand. Especially when I'm trying to explain this over the Discord application. Which I'm gonna I'm gonna have to look up for that specific page. Um, but in other words, you would use a a different subnet mask when you want to break your groups into Subnetworks, or at least you want to break a network into subnetworks. So, like, for example, if I had 10. Dot, no, I'm not even typing it in. Uh, we'll say 10. Dot zero. Dot, uh, uh, one. Dot one. Slash nine. Right. Um, don't. Don't get too, uh, what's the word? Don't get too into this example just because it is a slash nine and it's going to be a little difficult to explain. But um, in other words, it would that would mean that the first nine bits are in the one position, meaning that it's 255.128.0.0, correct? Correct. Alright, so that means that very first bit of the second octet can either be 1 or 0, meaning I can divide this into two subnet. I can divide the 10.0.0.0 network into two subnetworks. Um, if it's a 1, I'm sorry, if it's a 0, it'll just be 10.0.1.1. If it's a 1, it'll be 10.128.1.1. And I know it's a little hard to explain right now. 6, 7, 8. And then we have... So that's the reason why you would break it into subnetworks, just so you can have, like, you might have one entire network, the 10.0. Dot, or I'm sorry, the 10.0.0.0 network. But let's say that you want to have two specific groups within there. You're going to have a group that's 10.128.0.0, and you can have another group that's 10.0.0.0. Raj. 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 Graham's got something to say. No, I just said Raj. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought, oh, it says you're typing in something. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's because um, my push to talk is a key and I can't Raj. help. Raj, that makes so much sense now. Got it. Got it. Okay, let's uh, move on. We're going to kind of wrap it up. If we don't cover IPv6, I can just uh, go over it tomorrow with y'all. Um, so if we take a look at the example, does everyone see the slideshow now? Yes. Sure. Yes. All right. In the top example, we have 172.16.0.1 slash 16. 
And in the bottom example, we have 172.16.0.1. Well, let's take a look. 172.16.0.1 slash 16. It's saying that it would be classful. Why is that? Well, 172 would put us in... Class B. Yeah, Class B. So okay. first 16 would be uh, network yeah. ID. Okay, cool. And it also says for our provided subnet mask that it's slash 16, meaning so that our match. default and our provided subnet mask do match. Now let's take a look at the bottom example, 172.16.0.1 slash 18. Well, hold up. We said that this was still a Class B address, correct? Sure. Correct. Okay, so that means our IP address is going to be class less because our default subnet mask and our provided subnet mask of slash 18 do not match, meaning we end up with a... I can't just highlight the two bits for some reason. Uh, there we go. Those two bits are going to be our subnet ID, meaning that we have a classless IP address. Raj? Raj. 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 All right, cool. Now moving on into this one. Just like it says right here, it's just the same example, 172.16.0.0. We see that we have one entire network. That's what that cloud is representing. Just one network, right? Raj? Raj. Raj. And then moving into this one, it's 172.16.0.0 slash 18. Oh, didn't mean to do that. The, these two bits right here are going to be our subnet ID. Now, what what that means is that it's it could be a combination of several different subnetwork IDs. So we have 172.16.0.0. But remember that the first two bits can be changed into zeros or ones. So we have... Like I said, the 172.16.0.0 network. Then we have the 172.16.128. Um, Actually, I should change that. .64.0 network. 172.16.128.0 network. And the 172.16.192.0 network. Those are the four subnets that are within the overall network of 172.16.0.0. Raj? Raj. 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 All right, and then lastly, we have our broadcast address which is the address in our subnet that allows for communications with all the nodes in a subnet. For example, our IP address, 172.16.15.20 slash 16. Is that classful or classless? Classful. classful. Yeah, it's classful because it's a class B address, the classful uh, CIDR notation for that IP address is slash 16. So, typically, how do we determine our broadcast address? It's typically the very last value in that network, I, I'm sorry, in that IP address. So, a broadcast address for the network ID of 172.16.0.0 would be 172.16.255.255. The only thing that this address is used for is to broadcast to everyone in the network. Raj. Are there any questions? 
sir. No. Okay, and here it goes into a bunch of different examples. Um, let's do this. Gonna assign you all some homework real quick. All right, so for tonight, I want you all to go through, find all those. Um, I believe for day three, y'all should have reviewed uh, objectives one Bravo and one Charlie. Yes? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, cool. Yes. Well, we're going to, we'll do a brief overview of those tomorrow, and we'll finish up uh, IPv6 tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Monday. Ugh, excuse me. Monday. Any questions? What's the homework? Um, I typed it in the, in the chat. chat. It's, it's oh, right okay. under find the find the class license subnet mass network ID and host ID for the following. Yes, sir. All right, cool. Well, if no one has any questions or anything, um, make sure that you finish up the. Them. What's up? I'm going to stop the recording and get this uploaded for them if they want to listen to it again later. Um...